I am more controversial than you need to be to accomplish more than I can because I began talking about how criminal defense could challenge Roe when a criminal case was the only kind of case that could. I talked about it in my campaigns for Iowa State House in 1988 and 1990 and in my appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court in 1991, but it was not until 1993 that national media started picking on me, and that was after a new federal law passed that made killing an abortionist the only criminal action that could save lives. But in 1992, the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Law was passed by Congress with its acronym FACE, which made the penalty for sitting in front of a door three times the same as for shooting. That's when the shooting started and the sitting stopped, thanks to our bumbling Congress. The problem Congress didn't consider is that there are a few people whose hearts are broken so deeply for unborn babies tortured to death that they are willing to save a few thousand unborn lives even if the cost is spending the rest of your life in jail. Well, before 1992, hundreds of pro-lifers did just that. They sat in front of the doors, saved a few lives, were arrested, spent a few days to a few months in jail, got out, did it all again. Thousands of lives were saved, a few at a time, over the years by such actions. But when Congress punished sitting three times as much as shooting once, it became impossible to save even one life by sitting, because it took hundreds sitting to even save a few lives, and hundreds could never again be found to sit when the cost was each of the hundred spending a few uh, If there's only one person sitting, he could be arrested and removed in a few minutes so that not even one life could be saved. While by, by killing an abortionist, he could save several thousand lives in return for his lifetime in jail. I, I know there are some who claim no lives are saved when an abortionist dies. That claim is so ridiculous it doesn't merit a serious response, although I have addressed it previously and on my website at saltshaker.us. If you do think that's a compelling argument, contact me and tell me why you do and I'll respond to you. Congress's foolish act not only replaced sitting with shooting, but made the kind of case necessary to challenge Roe a case which involves shooting. I would much rather challenge Roe from a nonviolent case, but Congress foreclosed that possibility, with one interesting exception. The first defendant charged under face was not charged with sitting or burning or shooting, but was talking. That's right. All of Congress's work to authorize Janet Reno's Justice Department to protect, to protect abortions from violent interruption were focused like a laser on Regina Dinwiddie of Kansas City for amplifying her voice with a bullhorn. <laughs> I helped her write her appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. Anna Waco Reno's Justice Department requested an extra four months from the Supreme Court to respond to our brief, but the court would not hear our case. So, what is this necessity defense with the power to collapse legal abortion? The necessity defense says, you can't be punished for a lesser harm like breaking a minor law such as sitting on someone's grass if that was necessary to prevent a greater harm like saving the dozens of infant human beings scheduled to be murdered that day. If the harm prevented is significantly greater than the harm caused, the necessity defense does not allow prosecution of the harm caused. There are a few more details, but that's the gist of the necessity defense. The necessity defense is capable of toppling Roe v. Wade through the 
comparison of harms it invites. Theoretically, it could have decapitated Roe in two ways. First, had juries, whom all judges call triers of the facts, had juries across America been allowed to continue legal consensus about the that fact question that unborn babies are human beings, so therefore aborting them is a grave harm, that would have established what Roe said had to be established before legal abortion could end. Second, the second way that uh, the necessity defense could have toppled Roe theoretically was that while waiting for that consensus to build, juries acquitting defendants charged with saving unborn lives would have made a mockery of, un of abortion's legality and would have shut down murder offices even though they were ruled legal by the Supreme Court. Now, I acknowledge it's legally outrageous that Roe v. Wade doesn't let states save the unborn from abortionists, but the necessity defense allows individuals to save the unborn from abortionists. Roe erased penalties for murdering the unborn, while the necessity defense erased penalties for private individuals who stopped the murderers. Obviously, the road choice Roe justices did not foresee that leaving hanging the question of the humanity of the unborn would leave hanging also whether individuals could save the unborn after states could not. State Supreme Courts tried to fill in Roe's blanks to save abortion by stating what Roe, this, by stating that Roe said what Roe did not say. And uh, the results of the state Supreme Court's doing that were irrational, as I will explain shortly. Roe v. Wade was, had just created a profound contradiction in law. During the Operation Rescue cases before 1992, when Congress made it impossible to save lives peacefully, the necessity defense should have been a no-brainer. The harm caused consisted of killing at most a few blades of grass as we sat in front of the abortionist doors preventing mothers from coming in for their murder appointments. The harm prevented was the murder of typically about 30 babies scheduled for execution that day at just one of murder office. The kind of criminal action that invoked the necessity defense could be anywhere from the peaceful to the violent as long as it interrupted abortion. It could be any action from peacefully sitting in front of a door, like I did, to burning it down, to shooting. By 1994, several state Supreme Courts had ruled that the necessity defense applied to stopping abortion is illogical. They all said, how can abortion be legally recognized as a harm when it is constitutionally protected? They all said that, so on the basis of that tortured logic, the judges would not allow defendants to explain their only defense to the jury. By constitutionally protected, the state Supreme Courts didn't mean they had finally found something in the Constitution that protects baby killers. What they meant, of course, was that they read Roe v. Wade and Roe v. Wade said they spotted that uh, that right l lurking in the Constitution's shadows. Well, regardless of how irrational state Supreme Courts are were in that situation, when lawyers hear that several Supreme Courts are agreed that the sky is green and news reporters are unbiased, uh, lawyers give up arguing it. They accept it as the law of the land, and they advise Christians to believe it and obey it, no matter how irrational it is or, or how much blood it spills. But not me. 
when I see the judges ignore law, reason, the Constitution, the Word of God, and reality, I climb the tallest soapbox I can find and tell people, which really upsets news reporters, which in turn upsets pastors because of the commandment, Thou shalt not be controversial. That commandment, of course, is found in second denominations, which is such an important commandment that no other scripture on the subject is relevant, which and this also in turn upsets political strategists who calculate that voters will turn against one of their candidates unless their candidates are careful to prove they don't agree with me by publicly insulting me. In fact, news reporters solicit insults. They call up a variety of pro-life leaders, politicians, and others and, and ask them, how about it? Are you willing to insult Dave Leach to keep me from accusing you of agreeing with terrorism? Well, I said that the, the, the consensus of state supreme courts against applying the necessity defense to interrupting abortion, I said that is irrational. Now, here are my nine reasons why that's irrational.